Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Disability Competent Care Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session, and should you require assistance on today's call, or if you would like to ask a question, please press star, then zero. I'm now going to turn the conference over to Chris Duff. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Barb. You're welcome. On, on behalf of the Lewin Group, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and the Disability Practice Institute, I would like to thank you all for attending this, our fourth in a series on disability competent care. Today's presentation will be on disability competent primary care in particular. As Barb stated, my name is Chris Duff, and I'm the Executive Director of the Disability Practice Institute. First, I would like to orient you to the webinar platform. If at any time your slides are not advancing, please push F5 on your computer, and that should get the slides moving again. At the bottom of your screen, we have circled two icons that you can see in this slide here. The one on the right is for you to be able to print out the PDF slides for the presentation. You can have that during this presentation or you can save it for use afterwards. The other one circled, the red one, on the left at the bottom of the screen is for questions. So if at any time during the presentation you have a question, please push this icon and type in your question. If it is about the technology, someone behind the scenes will respond to your question in real time. If you have a question about the presentation and would like to pose it to the presenters, we will be compiling these throughout the webinar and will return to them during the Q&A. This is, as I said, this is the fourth in a series of nine webinars being presented throughout this fall. The previous three focused on, first, understanding the model of disability competent care and its key components. The second one focused on understanding the perspective of persons with disabilities as they experience the health care delivery system. And the third was on providing care coordination for adults with disabilities. A link to all three of these presentations, including the sound to go along with these PowerPoint slides, is available on our website at the address given at the bottom of each of these pages. Today, we're focusing on primary care, and in subsequent weeks, we will focus on the interdisciplinary care team, working with an individualized plan of care. That will be next week. The following week, we'll be focusing on managing transitions. And on November 12th, the focus will be on coordinating flexible long-term services and support. We will conclude the series in early December with presentations on building a disability competent provider network, and finally, participant and provider readiness. Each presentation will be 40 minutes in length, with 15 minutes reserved for Q&A at the end. As I said, all webinars are recorded, and the presentations, recordings, and PDF slides will be available within a few days at the link on this slide. We will send everyone who has signed up for this presentation and has, has joined us an email when this actual presentation has been posted. We will also keep you informed of future webinars and products being produced through this initiative. I would now like to step back just a moment to give you the genesis of this series and several other tools for integrating healthcare services for dual eligible populations. The Lewin Group, along with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement in Cambridge, as a contract with the Medicare and Medicaid Coordination Office at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to provide tools and technical assistance to providers that are seeking to integrate and better provide care for individuals who are eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid, commonly known as dual eligibles. As you are probably aware, CMS has been introducing several initiatives over the past couple of years to provide financial incentives for integrated care and to improve and streamline care for dual eligibles. 
our contractors to provide technical assistance to support those providers. Lewin and IHI have in turn partnered with the Disability Practice Institute to provide specific expertise in serving dual eligibles with disabilities, the majority of whom are under age 65. This takes us to the DCC Disability Competent Care webinar series and a presentation today. We would like this webinar series to address your needs and questions regarding the delivery of disability competent care, addressing where you and your organization are on the road to integration and care improvement. So please submit questions in writing, and we will additionally open up the phone lines at the end of the presentation for live questions. We are also asking you to please fill out a short survey at the end of the webinar where we will be asking you for feedback to make this series and our other efforts to um, meet your more immediate needs. I'm now going to turn this over to one of the presenters, to Lynn Morshida who will introduce the rest of the presenters and review the webinar outline. Lynn presented in the last webinar on disability competent care coordination. She brings 35 years experience with primary care and care coordination of medically complex populations. She, along with June Isaacson Cables and myself, co-authored the disability competent care assessment tool referenced throughout these webinars. I'll now hand it over to Lynn. Thank you, Chris. Now I'm going to introduce the two speakers who are going to provide most of the content today. June Kales is a disability policy consultant with 35 years experience working as a contractor with a variety of disabilities, managed care organizations, and government related projects as a consultant, trainer, writer, researcher, and policy analyst. She is also the Associate Director of the Harris Family Center for Disability and Health Policy at Western University of Health Sciences in Pomona, California. She has developed training material and curriculum in the areas in the ADA, Aging with a Disability, Disability Literacy and Competencies, and worked on dozens of national research and model development projects. She also teaches disability competency in the health professions, which makes her a perfect speaker for this webinar. She has a Bachelor's of Arts in Psychology from Hofstra University and a Master's in Social Work from the University of Southern California. She's going to speak about lessons learned in obtaining primary care. Then following June's talk, Mary Glover will speak about um, redesigns, primary care redesigns that better serve adults with disabilities, how to provide primary care as part of an interdisciplinary care team, avoiding hospitalizations and episodes of illness that are preventable, and leading practices for managing common secondary complications of living with a disability. Mary Glover is a nurse practitioner with over 30 years of clinical experience working with individuals with disabilities and complex medical conditions. She has been a practicing clinician with Commonwealth Community Care, formerly known as Boston's Community Medical Group, since its inception in 1988. Commonwealth Community Care is a group practice specializing in the care of adults with physical and developmental disabilities. They use the interdisciplinary care team, community outreach, home-based services to improve access and reduce barriers to care. In 2004, Mary assumed the role of Executive Director of Boston's Community Medical Group when the corporation was restructured as a not-for-profit group practice and clinical affiliate of Commonwealth Care Alliance. She is currently working to expand this model and make it available to more people throughout the Commonwealth. Ms. Glover received a Bachelor of Science degree in nursing from St. Anselm College in New Hampshire and a Master's degree in adult primary care nursing from Boston University. She is a board-certified adult nurse practitioner, 
and has wonderfully helpful illustrative examples. So now I'm going to hand the program over to June. Uh, thanks, Lynn, and hi, everyone. I'm speaking to you from kind of foggy, cloudy L.A. this morning. My disability is uh, cerebral palsy, which I've had since birth, and it affects my walking, my balance, and my coordination. As you can see from the slide, I'm a scooter user, and I've used a scooter for over 20 years. As Lynn said, I've actually held jobs besides being a contractor in aging, independent living, health care, mental health, and physical rehab, and worked with or in health care most of my life, which contributes to the values embedded in my belief system, systems. And they include independent living, values that is not necessarily being able to do everything independently, but being in control of how things are done. I believe disability, chronic conditions, and health can and do coexist. And I've learned that planning prevents poor performance in terms of my health care. So I always collect my questions, and I do any needed internet research before I see a healthcare provider. I believe it's important also to get and read and understand and maintain and share my medical records. For example, I update my medication records before a visit. So I can just whip them out and say here, rather than trying to remember um, what I, what I have. It's a, it's a good memory assist for me, so I don't miss anything and all those questions I tend to ask. I cringe at, and I do not accept when I hear the "you're just getting older" answers. And you know this occurs frequently. When healthcare providers are not knowledgeable about disability, aging with disability, and what can be done to mitigate or reverse some conditions, for example, uh, the importance of exercise or some physical therapy. As you can tell, I do believe in and practice being a savvy healthcare consumer and not surrendering personal power and control just because you're dealing with health care providers. And for me, this has evolved and strengthened over the years of experience working in health care. I'm also known as an interminable question asker, which I do control and prioritize for health care provider appointments. But I do believe I make my doctors and other healthcare professionals better by way of the quest of the questions I'm asking them. So about the elements I look for in healthcare providers, particularly in choosing my primary care provider and other providers. Well, first of all, by way of background, for many years I used my G G Y N doctor as my primary care provider, as I didn't really have too many issues. But well, oh, seven, eight years ago, she recommended that it's time I really get a primary care provider, and she recommended hers. Well, like life, you never get everything you want, and there are trade-offs. So here are some examples of my trade-offs regarding my primary care provider. In terms of physical accessibility, for me, easy parking is great when it's very close to a building, which means I don't have to unload my scooter from my car. And I also need uh, geographic access, which means not too far from where I live. 
that is by L.A. standards, which it's out of 20 to 40 minutes, depending on traffic. But for others, being on mass transit route is absolutely key. In terms of equipment, I wanted, but I didn't get from my primary care provider a height adjustable exam table or an accessible scale. But I can use what they had, have with assistance. And, you know, I just had an annual physical. And toward the end of the, the physical, the, my doctor said, you know, everything looks fine, but I'm concerned about the fact that uh, you didn't give me your annual lecture regarding not having an accessible exam table. And I explained, oh, no worries. I decided to vary the timing of delivery, hoping that I would have more impact and a better outcome. But for others, you know, a wheelchair scale or an height adjustable exam table or other accessible medical equipment like mammography or other radiology equipment is critical, and there are no trade-offs as is the availability of timely assistance with transferring on and off the equipment and assistance with dressing. In terms of communication, I had the ideal set up for me, which is I have a provider willing to communicate via email, which I don't abuse and use sparingly, but it's great as it saves me an enormous amount of time, including uh, annoying and unnecessary telephone tag and wasted travel time. I get quick answers regarding over-the-counter medication suggestions or referral, a form signed, or insurance approval, or a prescription renewed. And I know I can communicate during my frequent periods of travel if the need arises. For others, in terms of communication, there are issues regarding longer appointments. If one uses an interpreter or assisted listening device or an augmented communication system, that all affects the length of the appointment, as does someone who has speech that is more difficult to understand. And also, potentially time needed to maybe record follow-up instructions on voicemail or smartphone for people who don't read or can't read. Regarding disability knowledge of my primary care provider, well, there really isn't any. But, you know, that's in general, that's kind of hard to find from primary care providers. But what's important is that my doc is one to learn from and respect my deeper knowledge in this area. And he's willing to talk with other providers when needed or do some research. In terms of trust, if I need something in a letter or a form, I may fill it out, I may draft it, and he signs it. Again, respecting my knowledge and my skill set. In terms of the relationship, I look for trust, respect, a partnership, and mutual problem solving. And of course, dealing with my personality, sometimes people call me Dr. Wannabe, and I do teach self-advocacy and have written much material on being a savvy healthcare consumer. So providers have to be able to deal with that as being part of who I am. And just by way of uh, a bit of humor to illustrate this to you, a surgeon once told me she was going to take my case to present at Grand Round because of its uniqueness. I said, great idea, when? She said, you can't go to Grand Round. You're not an MD. I said, you mean major deity? Yes, I have one of those. Anyways, <laughs> trust and consistency I think is key. When my husband, who has the same primary care provider, ran into a medical problem, 
I emailed my primary care provider late one night, and by 7 a.m. the next morning, he shows up at my husband's bedside in the hospital. Now, the value of that is almost priceless. So, with regard to primary care provider, these are just some of my thoughts regarding key elements and trade-offs. So, Mary, over to you. All right, June. Thank you very much. So, June spoke about some of the fundamental elements that are critical in an effective primary care relationship. I'd like to start out by telling Pedro's story, which I think illustrates some of these core principles. Pedro uh, is a Spanish-speaking man from the Dominican who had sustained a spinal cord injury resulting in quadriplegia about five years prior to our meeting him. He came to the United States for medical care, and he was admitted to the hospital with a myriad of issues, including pneumonia, urinary tract infection, He had uh, a permanently, at that time, indwelling urinary catheter. He had a tracheostomy for chronic respiratory insufficiency, constipation, multiple pressure ulcers, incontinence. He was transferred after an acute hospitalization to a rehab facility, which is where our primary care team first met Pedro. Our team is uh, generally led by an advanced practice clinician, either a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant. And in this case, the physician assistant um, met Pedro at the facility. At that time, a discussion ensued about his goals. He identified that his short-term goal was to increase his independence with self-care and transfers, and he wanted to be able to wear sneakers again, which had become impossible because of lower extremity spasticity. Long-term, he wanted to be able to drive. He wanted to be more independent, a job, and a girlfriend, not necessarily in that order. So some of our initial plans and interventions at discharge so that he could get into the community centered around ordering durable medical equipment, including a hospital bed, an air mattress, an air cushion for his wheelchair to uh, reduce pressure when sitting, and some bath equipment. We were involved around housing advocacy and um, arranging transportation. His bladder management was adjusted so that his catheter was removed and he was uh, instructed in an intermittent catheterization regimen for his bladder. He was started on medications to reduce incontinence. His bowel program was, uh, a bowel program was developed and he was taught various strategies and techniques for managing his respiratory condition and managing his secretions. At that time, he was referred for some home health follow-up, particularly around wound management. So Pedro's care plan really involved multiple disciplines. Medically, uh, the primary care team made home visits, followed up on his bowel and bladder program and respiratory status, provided uh, wound follow-up and assessment, and coordinated all services, such as the home health services specialist, obtained labs, updated immunizations since no records were available and the history was unknown. We managed multiple episodic um, episodes of uh, urinary tract infections, changes in his skin, and respiratory exacerbations. He was referred to specialists such as pulmonary and ear, nose, and throat specialists because he uh, wanted to talk about removal of the tracheostomy tube and to review his pulmonary management. He was referred to a rehab uh, physician within our group to be considered for Botox injections to treat his spasticity. And our social service team was involved around housing advocacy and access of financial benefits. Just to give you a little picture of of what we found when we first started to um, be involved in Pedro's care, Um, there's no substitute really for home visiting. There's no substitute for really seeing uh, with your own eyes kind of what circumstances people are dealing with. And when we first saw him, he was living with his mother in a small, unsubsidized, inaccessible apartment. SSI was the only source of income, and his mother was his primary caretaker. We found numerous code violations in his apartment. There was water leakage in the ceiling of the bedroom and the bathroom. The carpeting was soaked and moldy, and he was using a space heater to keep warm. 
This was particularly problematic given his lifelong history of asthma and his respiratory um, status at the time. So this became a major issue for the team to support Pedro and his family in accessing new housing. So throughout the course of the next few years, our care team really provided this support on an ongoing basis, as well as coordinating various specialty interventions. Urology was involved around treatment of kidney stones and erectile dysfunction. E ENT was involved around multiple attempts to remove the trach tube and to treat uh, what, what ended up being uh, some tracheal stenosis and narrowing of his trachea, which caused some respiratory distress when we did try to remove the tube. Uh, his pulmonary status stabilized. He was referred to the Independent Living Center and was approved for personal care attendance, and he obtained housing. Our team physiatrist effectively managed his spasticity with repeat Botox injections, and he was ultimately able to wear his sneakers. So all of these services were coordinated by our primary care team. Our, uh, the lead PA often accompanied Pedro to specialty appointments when that was appropriate and needed around some of the complex issues that we were dealing with in an attempt to increase communication and, and really try to coordinate these plans, uh, which involved multiple outpatient procedures, some inpatient stays, and some follow-up at home. So on average, he received 10 visits a year by our primary care team during that period of time. So just to give you a quick snapshot of where he is now, he's 32 years old. He's gained 30 pounds. He had originally been described as cachectic in the um, first notes um, in his medical record. He's living in an accessible, subsidized ap uh, apartment with his mother. He employs personal care attendants. He's independent with power wheelchair mobility, and he attends a weekly peer support group, which is organized by our social service team. He was referred to Mass Rehab Commission for uh, ESL classes. He does continue to have some chronic skin ulcers, although they're mostly small and manageable, except for some of his uh, extended trips to the Dominican to visit family and friends, uh, and we work with him uh, around those issues. Uh, he continues to have the tracheostomy tube, but he's off the ventilator and his respiratory status is stable. He had a feeding tube for a period of time, which is now removed, and he's able to eat without aspiration. He's had one hospital admission for urosepsis since 2009, and he describes himself as stronger. So what are some of the key elements of effective primary care that were illustrated in, in this um, story about Pedro? First of all, I think uh, the, that building the relationship from the beginning was essential. The fact that our team went and spoke to him and really talked to him about what his goals of care were, what was important to him, um, and supported those efforts. Um, it involves active listening. It involves shared problem solving. There was an implementation of preventive strategies to reduce or eliminate some of the predictable and secondary complications. Some of that was accomplished through teaching, some through equipment, et cetera. And I think what stands out, too, is that the team had really an appreciation for the totality of the human experience, that the, that the care plan really did not focus on the disability. It did not focus exclusively on medical or health-related issues, but there was an appreciation of the importance of the context of psychosocial, sexual, vocational goals and concerns that he had. There was also an understanding of the importance of consumer-directed personal care and the importance of having a flexible, durable medical equipment benefit. So, you know, our model of care did not develop overnight. Um, we did not just wake up one morning and say, aha, this is the answer. <laughs> uh, we still aren't quite there yet. Um, but we have, I think, learned some lessons over the years in, in um, working with people with disabilities and providing primary care. And I think we've learned that it takes a team, it takes an interdisciplinary team, it takes people coming from different perspectives and different skill sets and coming together to work together towards common goals. It takes community outreach and integration of services, a person-centered approach to partnership, a relationship, again, that's built on strong listening skills and active listening and shared decision-making, a partnership. 
It also involves integration of hospital care and primary care teams to improve transitions of care when people do require hospitalization or other clinical settings. There also needs to be an emphasis on long-term services and supports, including, and very importantly, consumer-directed personal care and a flexible, durable medical equipment benefit. I think Pedro's story illustrates uh, some of the key disciplines involved in the care team. I'd like to add one, actually, to this list, one that I um, haven't included before, and I probably should, is I think the health plan is an important part of the care team. I think without the financial support and the recognition of the importance of primary care investment, without the ability of the clinical team to uh, access flexible benefit plan, I think, um, I think these are important uh, tools for the team to have access to in order to be able to facilitate appropriate primary care. So, you know, I think Pedro's story illustrates some of the more complex situations that we might find ourselves involved in. I'd like to step, take a step back and talk a little bit about some of the issues that June has already raised around some more uh, routine and primary care, uh, more routine procedures that you might um, uh, identify with primary care. And, and uh, we've already mentioned pap smears, mammograms, weights, I think it's really uh, important to understand that people with disabilities historically really experience disparities in these areas. Um, healthcare Voices in Massachusetts um, identified 32% of people with disabilities had experienced barriers to healthcare, either around physical access, communication access, or cost. The, the uh, Disability Policy Consortium in Massachusetts has identified several areas where people with disabilities uh, do not experience the same health care that people without disabilities experience. Two of these key areas are in the um, clinical breast exam and in cervical cancer screening. People with disabilities often uh, receive these procedures less. This, pre, this, this increases their risk for late diagnosis of breast cancer and cervical cancer and can certainly result in poorer outcomes and higher morbidity and mortality. Um, there are numerous examples um, that we could talk about in this arena, but the, re, the uh, reality is that the, available of, the availability of accessible medical equipment is an important part of providing accessible medical care and healthcare providers have a responsibility to ensure that medical equipment is not a barrier to people with disabilities. Some of, some of this equipment we've already spoken about, accessible height exam tables, wheelchair accessible scales, adjustable height radiologic equipment, portable floor, overhead track lifts, et cetera. Being weighed can be a really critically important um, event. It, it actually can influence medication dosages. Um, certain tests and procedures are dependent upon an accurate weight. So we can actually really do harm to people if we're not able to, um, to have an accurate weight. And a critical but often overlooked component of, of this whole area is, is adequate and ongoing training of staff. And this is really essential. The equipment doesn't do you any good if people don't know how to use it. Uh, and I think it's important to encourage staff to ask the individual questions about how they want to be assisted and how they want to use the equipment, because not every person uses mobility devices in the same way. Everyone has different um, physical capabilities, et cetera, and so it's not wrong. In fact, it should be encouraged to talk to the individual and to ask them how, how, they, how they can be assisted or how they want to be assisted if they want to be assisted. Another key component of our care structure is the, our ability to be responsive, and we really build our teams around this, uh, around this need. We really feel it's valuable to not only be able to provide ongoing predictable care, but also to be able to be responsive when unexpected things come up. I, I, I'll just illustrate this with one example that happened in our, in our practice just probably about a month ago. Um, this was a, a new person to our practice. She was 65 years old. She had recently undergone a neurologic decline, which resulted in her requiring a ventilator uh, for respiratory support. Her primary care, which was primarily 
carried out through an outpatient setting, felt at that time, given her change in status, that they were not able to meet her needs, and so she transitioned to our practice shortly after an extended hospital stay followed by a rehab stay. She was in the community, and her family called our office to say that her oxygen levels were low. You know, the, the average primary care response in those situations might be to send her back to the hospital or have her at least come to the emergency room for evaluation. However, this woman really wanted to stay home. She was not in any distress. She had kind of had it, had it with hospitalization, and so she um, really did not want that. Our nurse practitioner was able to go out to the home and make an urgent um, home visit. She was able to stabilize her status with suctioning and ambu bag breathing and was able to consult with the physician over the phone for ongoing plan of care, coordinate with the respiratory company to obtain some additional supplies and equipment that could be used in the home to help uh, this individual manage her respiratory status. Her caretakers, family, et cetera, were taught um, how to utilize this equipment, and we were able to coordinate with social services around accessing increased personal care at home. So this is just one example, but, you know, we have many examples where, you know, our ability to really just get out there and see people um, can really avoid emergency rooms and hospitalizations, and um, we were able to avoid it in this situation that was several weeks ago, and she has not been back to the hospital since. So um, it was a successful strategy, and I think it's empowering to people to be, to, to be able to take charge and really manage their issues and not... Um, feel like they're reliant on the hospital at all times. Another strategy that we have initiated is a designated inpatient unit um, that's pretty self-explanatory. We have a designated hospital unit where all of our folks go. It allows us to build relationships with staff. It allows us to have daily communication and good coordination of transitions. But one of the newest um, issues here that we are working on is the integration of personal care attendants into the hospital team. This is something that's been done informally for many years. Many of our folks do um, uh, ask that their PCAs can come into the hospital and provide some supportive care. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's been pretty ad hoc and pretty dependent on the unit and sometimes the individual nurse at the time. Um, however, we are working with our hospital to really formalize this process so that PCAs, when the consumer requests uh, and wants it, uh, can come into the hospital, be part of the primary care team, can actually provide services in the hospital. We think that this could really um, improve um, improve satisfaction with care in the hospital. It can reduce some strain on hospital resources. We're hoping that it will uh, reduce lengths of stay and allow people to transition in and out of the hospital more smoothly and less traumatically, and most importantly, provide increased autonomy and independence to the individual to really um, to be able to have um, the same care that they receive at home in the hospital. Despite how well-trained hospital staff is, there is no substitute really for the individualized care that a PCA provides under the direct supervision of the consumer. PCAs get to learn individually how people like to be positioned, how they like to transfer, how they like to be suctioned, et cetera. And, you know, there's, there's really no substitute for that kind of individualized um, care structure. So we're very um, excited about that opportunity. So just to summarize, um, yes, there are some problems, there are some challenges in primary care, but I think there are also opportunities, and I think we've talked about a few approaches um, that we've taken um, to try to um, improve primary care and improve access to primary care. And just to quickly summarize, we've talked about a team approach, an interdisciplinary team, 24-7 access by the primary care team, and I think that's critical. We don't, um, you know, um, send that out to some anonymous call service. It's our team that takes those calls. We have the capacity for home visits and transferring clinical decision-making into the home meaningful consumer involvement in the care plan design and development, 
and organizing hospital and specialty services in close collaboration with the primary care team and fully integrated, um, along with a fully integrated electronic medical record for communication and data support. And these are things that we are working, working on diligently as we speak. So um, I think I'll just end there and I guess open it up to questions. Ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to ask a question, please press star then zero on your phone. You will hear an acknowledgement tone. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up the headset before pressing the number. Once again, if you have a question, please press star then zero at this time. If you wish to remove yourself from the queue, please press pound the pound key. Thank you, Barbara. I appreciate your giving those instructions. And Mary and June, thank you very much for your presentation. We have a couple questions that came in while you were speaking. First of all, Mary, how long were you working with the first person you were speaking of? I believe it was Pedro. And the changes that came across, how, can you give us a bit of a sense of context? Missy Price was wondering. Um, about how, the, how the, the changes of getting back on top of his care, how long that took? Uh, well, we've known him uh, four to five years at this point, but many of the changes in terms of uh, housing um, and that sort of thing was able to be accomplished in probably the first year or so. It actually was quite a complex process, and I didn't go into a lot of detail about it, but uh, he had been living uh, in Puerto Rico, um, so we had, we had to do a lot. There was like a list of six or eight things that had to be accomplished in order to even get him on the waiting list for housing. Uh, so that was that was actually fairly complex. He had to get information from his landlord in Puerto Rico. He had to get Corey information from out of the country. We had to get income verification. We had to do reasonable accommodation, support letters, et cetera, et cetera. So, and then then that's just to get on the waiting list. So um, so that took a year or two. And the medical issues have really been settled um, for probably the last. A uh, couple of years, he's really uh, he went through quite a long process with his tracheostomy issues and multiple laser procedures, et cetera, to try to uh, to try to overcome that issue. So that that was kind of an ongoing thing over probably three or four years. Thank you, Mary. Lynn, I'd like to kind of pose that to you. Is, is Mary's experience with Pedro, which is basically a lot of time up front, a good year, maybe two years. Uh, and then the person often stabilizes and uh, needs less intervention. Is that a common experience? I think that's a very common experience, as long as the team hangs in there with the person. And, and there's good oversight. Thank you. Um, Denison Bryson Fleming. Question as a question for Mary again is how does the PCA get paid for these services they provide in the hospital? Well, that's an excellent question. Thank you for asking because I forgot to mention that. Um, this is one of the benefits of a global payment or capitated model of care is that we are able to be flexible with the benefits and we can really make those decisions that we think are in the best interests of the individual and and perhaps even be cost effective in the long run. Um, and so uh, under a global payment system, we're able to approve services when people are hospitalized. Under a traditional system, they can't be. Um, so in the past, when people had their PCAs come into the hospital, sometimes it was because they just wanted to help the individual and they didn't get paid or there were other arrangements made, but it wasn't officially reimbursed. Thank you. And we have a question from Mary Steinkamp. She was wondering, Mary, does your unit have a hospice and palliative care program? And how do you integrate that with your team? Uh, another very good question. Um, we, we actually have focused on a palliative care approach so that um, because, because of the way the hospice benefit is formally structured, it really often means a transition to a hospital team 
I mean, to a hospice team as opposed to our team. And since so much of what our team does really is what hospice would do, the home visiting, the support, the social service support, behavioral health components, et cetera, um, we have kind of created a, a, a hospice light, so to speak, and uh, we have a palliative care consultant within our team, and we also have relationships with hospice where we actually have um, contracted for sort of a la carte services. So if there is a certain component of hospice care that we feel um, our patient can benefit from, um, that our team just isn't able to provide, we can actually access that particular benefit rather than needing to buy the whole hospice package if that's not what's needed. Thank you, Annette. You know, just thinking about it from the perspective of your participant or member, how nice to be able to bring that knowledge and competency by the people who that person already knows versus getting a whole different group of people coming in and providing some services. So uh, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, Barb, do we have any questions um, through the phone lines at this point? All right, and our first question does come from Melissa Miller. Please go ahead. Yes, I'm Melissa Miller, and I wanted to know how the physician gets reimbursed for the added time that's necessary to address all the psychosocial issues and the uh, complex care needs of, of social uh, and support services of disabled patients and the added visits that may be necessary, 10 visits rather than the usual four per year, um, how doctors will be incented to spend the added, added time that's likely necessary for such complex care needs. Uh, well, again, I think it brings us back to the uh, the payment structure, the global payment or capitated structure where we're not reimbursed on a fee-for-service basis. So you're not locked into that, you know, you have to make X number of visits a day in order to bring in enough income to support the practice. We have the luxury and the, the great benefit of being able to really um, address people's needs individually. And if it's 10 visits a year, if it's two visits, it's a year, if it's an hour-long visit or if it's a 15-minute visit, we, we can actually um, do what makes the most sense for that individual. And sometimes, you know, a longer visit um, actually ends up being more effective and more efficient in the long run. But you have to take the long view of this, you know, and I think that's what's hard sometimes for people and for insurances and for the people responsible for the financing because because it is an investment, and it's an investment somewhat on faith that if you really invest the financing in upfront into a really robust primary care system, that you will in the long run reduce complications, re reduce hospitalizations, reduce expensive modes of care, and invest it not just, you know, not just a pay less, but, but actually invested in things that actually improve people's quality of life, primary care, durable medical equipment so people can function more independently in the community, et cetera. And, and you know, so that's really the, the benefit of a global payment structure. I, I also think that, I think that's a question Thank I you. hear from a lot of plans. And I wanted to share a few other things that have worked and, and have not worked. Uh, an example of something that hasn't worked in Minnesota um, a, several years ago, uh, we established a plan where we worked with the clinics and we actually provided the clinics a $20 PM PM for all the members who were assigned to that clinic. Um, that enabled us to get the contract with the clinic and that was great, but that never translated down to the practicing physicians or nurse practitioners. So they still experience the pressure in their daily schedule when one of our members would appear because they knew that took more time. So that PMPM to the clinic just didn't seem to work. We then moved and we're beginning to work with actually purchasing time from physicians in their schedule. So we would purchase uh, two two-hour blocks throughout the week where the, person would not, where the physician would not be scheduled but be available to the care teams for consultation. That wasn't necessarily the timeliness that we wanted, the immediate response, but it did give some 
um, dedicated time to problem solve with the care team. So that was effective. Some other practices I've heard have worked is paying a, a fairly large, uh, and I've heard in the amount of $60, $70 PM, PM, um, to physicians who then would carry a fairly large panel and would keep um, up to 20 hours of their time free every week to be able to respond. Another option is, um, and I'm familiar with this is done in a couple of states, where they actually share savings um, with the clinics uh, at the end of the year as, as a result of reduced hospitalization. So that's kind of an after the fact kind of a reward, a promised reward incentive. So what I'm trying to say here is uh, the, the key, the, the, the best thing would be the team practice concept that Mary is able to put into place. Short of that, there is a variety of practices that have been used to varying, varying degrees of success. And you'll just need to be flexible and see how what, what your priorities are within your, your practices you're working with. Okay, um, Barb, did you have another question? Yeah, our next question comes from Mary Steinkamp. Please go ahead. Mary Steinkamp. Well, actually, my question was already asked. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And again, if you have any questions, press star zero. If your name has been collected, you want to press star one. Okay, another question that came forward um, was, do you use all levels of primary care physicians, uh, practitioners, physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants? And if you do use different levels, how do you decide who to use when within your model and approach? Mary, could you take a start at that? Uh, sure. So I, our primary care teams are generally led by either a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant, and there's no real uh, distinction in our practice in terms of uh, other than geography. Uh, because of the home visiting uh, component of our practice, we really have to um, organize our teams uh, somewhat geographically based to uh, make it somewhat efficient. Um, the RNs on our team uh, are, are assigned to each, uh, each NPPA team has an RN assigned to their team. The RNs at this point in time do a lot of the um, initial assessments that are uh, required by the state and also to do um, some skilled nursing um, to reduce you know, uh, VNA use, if that's possible, integrate that role into our care team, provide some care coordination support and some assistance with care plan development, et cetera. And our physicians are always available and are part of the team, very active members of the team. We meet regularly and have interdisciplinary uh, care team rounds. And our physicians are always available um, to see folks, to uh, consult with us over the phone, et cetera. Um, the other members of our team, behavioral health, social service, PTOT, et cetera, um, health outreach workers are really kind of brought in on an as-needed basis, probably more often than not. Um, they're certainly part of our care team discussions, et cetera. They may not always be, be called in to see people face-to-face -face depending on the issues that are being presented. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question well enough. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, and I have a question here for June, I think. How would you recommend setting up a waiting room that has room for wheelchairs? As a clinic, this person works at people use wheelchairs and usually hanging out in the middle of the aisle, um, and should I test my ideas for change? And this was from Kristen Hoshman. Yes, uh, Chris. Good question. I think that uh, waiting room access should be part of the way we look at accessibility. If it's a small waiting room, at least at least one space for a wheelchair user so they don't feel like they're, they're on display waiting in the middle of the, of the room, if they can even get to the middle of the room. Attention to aisle width is also important, as is attention to... Um, reach ranges in terms of being able to reach uh, public education material and brochures and that kind of thing. If it's a large practice with multiple rows of, of seating areas, then certainly more than one space should be created. And we also need to remember to also create um, bariatric seating for people who are extra large and don't fit into traditional uh, waiting room 
uh, area. So good point. That should be part of our looking at accessibility. Kristen, also I believe in our second webinar series um, about pe the experience of people with disabilities in obtaining their healthcare services, we had a list of a variety of um, resources. And I think one of those specifically addressed accessibility issues within a practice setting, so I would encourage you to go to that list. Barb, do you have any other questions online? There are no more questions at this time. You may continue. Okay, great. Um, another question that we have received, and I think I will, um, I think this is best for Mary. And I know, Mary, you're, the, the Massachusetts program is starting on January 1, and you're now opening for enrollment. The question that we received was are we, that they are expecting to enroll thousands of members each month. How do they modify? How do you modify your model? Because they, you, they simply aren't able to conduct in-home assessments, in-home, in-person assessments with that number of people every month. So how do you triage and prioritize to make sure that you are getting the attention to the people who are in most immediate need at the time? Uh, well, that's an excellent question, and we're grappling with that as we speak, Chris, because uh, we actually went live October 1st. Oh, And uh, we have uh, 1,100 people enrolled in month one. Wow. <laughs> yes, and uh, about that many coming in month two. Uh, so, uh, so it obviously does uh, make us kind of uh, change our strategy in terms of how we approach at least this initial phase of the uh, of the pro of the assessment process. And you know, I think we have to look at the at the assessment as a process and not an event. And it actually has to take various forms. And so, our initial um, outreach is really through our member services. To, to do a phone outreach, a welcome call. We have a clinical operations department centrally that is uh, doing phone health risk screens and trying to do that stratification, trying to identify who has primary care engagement, who does not, who has the most complex issues, who might have a pressing immediate need, prioritize those folks for an in-person assessment. We are required to do a face-to-face -face as part of the assessment process on everyone. And um, so it, it's resulting in us, you know, having to really pull resources together from multiple areas um, within the organization and contracting out to do some of this initial outreach. Um, you know, in our senior care options program, we've we've been successful with like an enrollment nurse model in some areas where there's actually a designated nurse who really does um, the initial assessment, becomes very expert at it, and then can do a handoff to the team identifying the priorities and the, the immediate issues that need to be addressed. Then the primary care team can kind of take it from there and start to, to go through the process um, with the individual. Um, but, you know, it certainly does present logistical challenges, and we, um, we weren't quite sure what to expect in terms of enrollment, but it is, it is pretty robust. So um, we're, we're looking for strategies on how to deal with that. <laughs> I think that's, that's a great way to end up. I think what we're really saying throughout this, this presentation, as well as all the webinars we've been doing, is this is all a work in progress. And everyone um, needs to just simply step back and think about what will work in your context. We're just merely trying to present what we've developed and some of the, the programs that have been out there in the past. So I'm going to wrap it up at this point. We've reached the end of our time today. As I indicated at the beginning, we have five more webinars over the next two months. Everyone who signed up for a previous webinar, as well as for this one, will receive notice of all future webinars. I would also like to say there were several questions received that we were not able to answer, and we will make sure that they are answered offline by the presenters. I would again like to thank the speakers for their presentation today, and I would like to ask that all of the participants take a minute or two and go to the participant survey that we have um, in the presentation deck. And um, so that we can learn from your experience and get your ideas for the future. Please join us next week for the next 
presentation, which will be on working with working as an interdisciplinary care team to develop an individualized plan of care. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate your attending. Back to you, Barb. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude your conference for today. Thank you for your participation and for using AT&T Executive Teleconference Services. You may now disconnect.